The problem we ran into, though, is that, remember, our original business plan was, hey, let's only get the hits. So we waited for, till it was a hit, then we bought it. Well, then a couple of our smaller competitors started trying to jump us in the market, try to buy before it even it was being produced, right? So then we had to start making some decisions early to avoid that, and then streaming happened. Then it was over without waiting for anything. We were buying shows before the first episode even came out. We'd have a, a deck this thin that says, here's some pictures, an idea of what this show is. You're going to buy it for a million bucks? That was, that's, the, that's the deal that <laughs> went down now. And so you're buying shows off of nothing because you got to simulcast it within a day after it hits Japan because within two days it's on a pirate site. So you had to be out there. And so um, we're buying shows, like I said, on a few pieces of paper. So then the title selection became all about, um, first and foremost, is it based on a manga? Because when you look at all the original programming that the studios have pumped out of Japan, original content, a large percentage failed compared to a manga-based title. So a manga-based title is four times more likely to succeed for various obvious reasons. Um, the other thing is you still have genres that don't work. And they, a lot of them still don't work, like sports anime or period, historic period pieces. Now, yes, there have been breakouts in sports anime, like finally there was one on volley, girls volleyball, I think it was called Haiyu, Hai, Hai, Haikyuu, that bro broke out. Um, you know, but they're, they're rare. And um, like I said, historic period pieces, even samurai period pieces, you'd think people wouldn't be into samurai anime. But if it's purely historical without a sci-fi fantasy twist, it, probably wasn't going to work. Simpsons like comedy, you know, family like guy like comedy. Um, idol bands, huge money made in Asia off of girl idol bands and stuff, right? Can't make a penny in North McNamara with those. I don't know why. So we don't know why, but honestly, but you know, so, so genre matters a lot in the title selection part. Um, and then, of course, the other part, two parts of title, collection, uh, title selection was politics, meaning, oh, you want this hit? Well, let me introduce you to two of her cousins over here. <laughs> and so we'd have to buy all three titles you know, to get the hit. The two cousins came with the package, you know. <laughs> um, uh, so that's title selection. Uh, another, uh, another problem with the Japanese market that's very different than Hollywood is that they're terrible at at the way they do sequels. They, they don't do sequels. And there's a whole bunch of reasons on why you'd think they would just keep pumping out sequels, but they, they, their structure doesn't really allow it. One of the interesting things we were just talking over lunch was that you'd started out in electrical engineering um, and were working for IBM at first. And um, I wanted to get a sense of like why you're, you know, you're already doing it so well in, 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 in that career, you chose to pivot and then uh, come to Columbia uh, Business School. And maybe you could say a few words also on how that shaped you professionally. Yeah, well, so, um, <clears throat> see, I had Asian parents, and my dad was an electrical engineering professor at Purdue, so I had a lot of encouragement <laughs> to uh, go down that route. Um, so, uh, you know, that started, you know, and of course, electrical engineering from Purdue is a great career, high paying jobs, jobs everywhere, you know. But, um, but as I started working and all, I realized that um, the very, very best people were totally passionate about their engineering. So they would spend nights or even all nighters trying to figure out that new algorithm or try to, uh, come up with a way to get a few cycles out of that micro, micro, microprocessor, for example. And I spend my evenings reading business books and strategy and how to run companies, because that's where all my passion was. So clearly, it was obvious to me that if I really wanted to be the top of the game, I had to follow my passion, which, by the way, when we recruit people at Funimation, we talk about this all the time among the executives, is get the guy with passion, right? And so. Um, so I decided to make a hard pivot. I didn't, I didn't see a quicker way to jump into the business side other than getting an MBA, so, and especially an MBA from a top school, because a top school like a Columbia can immediately propel you into that kind of career, and it did, by the way. And so I got my MBA, Columbia, which did immediately propel me onto the business side. 
Um, Accenture hired me. It's called Anderson Consulting back then. We were, we were their strategy group out of Manhattan, so our entire competition was McKinsey, Booz Allen, Bain, and, um, and actually half our staff was from McKinsey, actually. Um, but um, so we, we did that, and I was right in the business side. Of course, they wanted to take advantage of my high-tech background, so I was doing uh, consulting at the, the C-suite level of high-tech companies. So it immediately got me into that, into that side. It was a very quick transition for me, which really helped me, uh, like I said, dive right into my passion. So I want to talk a little bit about your transition into anime per se. Um, so you've, you, you founded Funimation in 1994, so about uh, five years after you had um, uh, uh, gotten your MBA. Um, and uh, then you, you uh, uh, came to, to uh, helm the, the efforts to bring Japanese anime, which I imagine at that time, so I'm thinking back to my childhood. I, there, was, there was Speed Racer, and I couldn't have think, thought of any other. Which we represent. OK, title, there you go. Way, okay. so. so I was, a, I was that I'm one. dating myself. But that <laughs> was um, uh, the, the, the Japanese anime I watched as a kid. I loved it. Um, and um, um, but, but bringing, you know, uh, your efforts were to bring uh, Dragon Ball Z to North America. And I wanted to just talk about that transition a little bit. Um, um, you know, how did you get that started? How did you, 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 you start up that, 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 that business? And how did you, right, you know, you're, you're, you're a person who's kind of on that edge between, um, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, uh, born in Japan, but basically raised here from, I think it was the age of four or so. So, so probably culturally, you're very uh, American, I suppose. Um, and how did you get, you know, you going, how did you get back to Japan, get, get those companies to be able to trust you so that you would be the person to do this? Yeah, well, um, so at that time, I was working at Tandem Computers um, in the Silicon Valley. They were pretty big computer company by then. Um, and, but I, what I started seeing was that I saw that Tandem's future in the next three to five years started looking kind of bleak to me, uh, you know, because I had a lot of access to that. I was at the, at the enough of a high left level to see what was going on in all of Tandem. And so, so I decided, hmm, I, I got to leave Tandem, go to something that's going to grow. Tandem's, you know, got some problems. Um, the main problem basically with Tandem was, was that they made fault tolerant systems, but because to make them fault tolerant, they had proprietary operating system, proprietary programming language, proprietary uh, relational database, and the entire um, computer industry at that time was shifting toward open systems such as Unix. And so, um, and so I started looking around for something else to do. I, I've always been an entrepreneur all my life, so I said, I'm going to go find a startup in the high-tech industry. So I assumed I was going to go work for a high-tech startup. Um, sure enough, Tandem did have problems, and you know they got bought out by Compaq Computers, who got bought out by Hewlett Packard. So they're all part of Hewlett Packard now. But, but um, so I, I looked around, but I remember like I lived my whole a whole year in Japan in the eighth grade because um, my parents, you know, took the whole family, let us spend a whole year there. And, and I'd seen all this great anime and manga. Uh, you know, manga is Japanese comics, so anime and manga. Uh, and, I, and then now here I was in my early 30s and, and sitting there going, why isn't that in the US yet? I mean, well, the content is so great. And so um, fortunately, my uncle uh, uh, was a well-known producer director in Japan on the live action side, not on animation. And so since I had that contact, I said, well, it's not going to be that hard to do a little due diligence. So contacted my uncle. Hey, I, I'm thinking we should bring anime over to America. And so he started that relationship by um, introducing me to Toye. He worked for Toye Live Action. He introduced me to Toye Animation side and their US agents in Los Angeles. And that started a conversation. By the way, my uncle. Um, uh, was a producer director for some famous movies in Japan like Power Rangers and Mass Rider or Kamen Rider. So, um, so he had some cloud over in Japan as well. So, so went to Toei, just said, well, they have hundreds of shows. I'm like, well, which one do you want? And I said, well, what's your most successful? And he said, well, Dragon Ball. And I'm like, well, that's the one I want because 
<laughs> and, and because the genre really matched the US market, you know, action adventure um, type of show. So, and then they immediately said, well, no way in hell. So that was that. <laughs> um, they were not going to give a startup uh, the rights to Dragon, license to Dragon Ball rights to me. So, so it took nine months of uh, pleading and trying to bribe them with big, not bribe, but offering license fees that were in the million range, you know, or so, and said, here, we're willing to license it for a million. And my uncle was pressuring them, giving them all sorts of gifts and <laughs> from the Tokyo side. And eventually, uh, an agent in the US, just was, all they were doing is eyeing the commission they'd get. So they were pushing the Japanese because <laughs> of the commission. Um, and finally, they said, you know, let's just take the guy's money. You know, anime is not going to work in America. Nobody in America wants anime. Let's just take his million bucks and let's go. You know? <laughs> and so they did the deal. And that's how it all started. Of course, I, had, I didn't have a million bucks, so I had to raise uh, seed capital. A couple million came from one single family out of the Texas area, the Coconauer family, who are still great friends of mine. And the Coconauers funded the seed. Um, and uh, off we went uh, from there. Um, also, my business, the business plan was quite simple, which was, um, you know, um, A, uh, I figured, hey, bring over a hit. If it's not a hit in 12 months, I can go right back into the high tech industry. I, I thought my resume was solid enough. I could just jump right back in. No big deal. Silicon Valley loves people that fail in startups anyway. Um, <laughs> and so, so, you know, had that, and, 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 but, but um, the business plan is simple. Hollywood has two really big problems. One is on original content, things that aren't sequels and such, uh, they have no idea it's going to be a hit or not, right? And the second problem they have is it costs a buttload of money to make content, right? And so I just simply said, well, okay, well then, I'll get rid of problem one. I'll just take something that's already been a hit. And especially Dragon Ball had already crossed cultures and been a hit in multiple cultures, so not just Asia. And then second, I'll license it for 10 cents on the dollar. And so that's how I did it. And so that was the basic plan, and off we went. Um, so, um, and then how did I get the trust I think you had? Well, well, honestly, when a major studio like Toei out of Japan gives you one of their major franchises, you get instant credibility in Japan. And so that gave us instant credibility. Uh, but then when we made Dragon Ball Head, which is one of the few original anime hits in America, as you know, um, well, our credibility shot through the roof. These are the only guys that can make a hit in America kind of attitude, even though they, there was one other hit at that time simultaneously called Pokemon that was working pretty well, too. <laughs> um, and so well, those were the two. But the company that, the US company that took Pokemon went bankrupt uh, because after po they made a ton of money on Pokemon, they ran into other issues uh, trying to do lots of new original content. And uh, we didn't go that route. We kept buying anime. So um, they didn't. They wanted to start doing Americanized shows. So, so, so I want to just talk a little bit. I mean, that, 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 that's great about the basic strategy, about some of the, the legal hurdles and, and, and regulatory hurdles that you, you, you faced. Um, kind of what were the challenges in kind of transporting Japanese property here? What were the legal challenges that you um, uh, faced in, um, you know, handling the ownership, distribution rights, things like that? Well, on the legal side, there wasn't a lot of friction because you, you have to understand by then, Japan had already been licensing their content to lots of Asian distributors. So they've done lots of third-party license deals. And then titles like Dragon Ball Z, they were able to make it a hit in Mexico, Spain, France. So they had licensing deals to those kind of countries as well. And so there was a certain process and a certain contract template they used. So we were able to just go through that structure, which was a perfectly good, fair deal structure. Um, but uh, really, and there weren't regulatory issues on the content except for how censorship worked. Well, we can talk about censorship later uh, in its own right. Um, and so, so really, at the end of the day, yeah, it wasn't that bad. But, but but the issue about the legal system, when you once you're in partnerships with the Japanese, is they don't like lawsuits. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing deals and projects with these big companies, um, if something suddenly doesn't work out the way they need it for political reasons, for approval or anything, 
it doesn't almost matter what the contract says. <laughs> you know, you play ball or you get blackballed, right? <laughs> so, so we were always known as the company that found a win-win solution and always worked it out, even though it was clear in our contract what the rights we had and whatever, we would, uh, you know, cave, <laughs> basically, a lot of times. Now, on the flip side, in 25 years as CEO, thousands of contracts we had with uh, every major Japanese studio and, and that TV network and everybody out there that we did deals with, we have never, ever been sued by a Japanese company. We've never even had to go to arbitration. We've never had to go to mediation, ever, uh, during my tenure. So, you know. Um, so, could, so I want to switch from the legal to the, to the cultural aspect of. Well, you did ask about challenges, right? Um, I said I said challenge, but you, you, you yeah. Well, that's the, the legal part wasn't the challenge. The challenge was TV distribution yeah. in the U.S. And you, everything at that time was based on you better get on TV and get those eyeballs on the show. And the Hollywood not invented here, and all these issues we ran into were were a real problem for us in getting TV distribution at first. And so that was really the main hurdle we had to overcome before Dragon Ball could be successful. Um, and so, you know, I remember pitching these program directors at all the major television networks and the syndicators and all this. And, and you know, the responses we tended to get were, well, very much a nod invented here. Hollywood thought they've made the best animation in the world. It's hand down, hands down. Nothing can compete. Um, but we also, we got lots of comments like, well, this Dragon Ball Z is serialized. It's like, you can't do a serialized kids show. It's got to be episodic where each story ends on its own. You can't have it like continue from episode to storyline continue. The kids don't have that kind of patience in America. They don't have that ability to follow a series. So they said, <laughs> there's no way Dragon Ball Z will succeed because of that. Another comment we often got was, wait, your, your characters actually grow up, get married, have children in Dragon Ball Z. What the heck is that? Do you ever see Donald Duck or Mickey Mouse change at all? <laughs> oh my god, this is a definite failure. You know, <laughs> things like that. Um, even, even the fact that they said, you can't call the name Dragon Balls, you know? Like, well, it's not Dragon Balls, it's Dragon Ball Z. And he goes, no, 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 Dragon Balls. I'm like, no, it, it really is not about dragon testicles. I take my word for it, right? This is Dragon Ball Z. But so, oh, well, you got to change the name, whatever. And so those are the kind of things I heard all the time from, from, from the programming people. But eventually, um, and remember, we're going into these pitches with data, right? Like, we're like, yeah, but... It's now generated $3 billion of revenue overseas, not just in Asia, but in France, in Mexico, in Spain. You cannot tell me this is not a cross-cultural hit wonder. And uh, they went with their gut feel. So basically, all the Hollywood people I talked to went with their gut feel that they were smarter than the data. And so, um, so eventually, though, we did get it on syndication with Haim Saban brought it into syndication, and if you know what TV syndication is, that means you gotta go literally city by city selling each individual TV station to give, them, give you a time slot, right? And at that time, kids, TV stations were buying individual shows for Sunday morning and, and after school time blocks at the time. Um, but, and Haim Saban is, is famous for um, bringing Power Rangers from Japan to America, so he kind of understood the concept of bringing Japanese content to, to America, obviously. Um, uh, and so he, his syndication group took it out, but the kids' syndication market right at that time was completely collapsing in the US. But we had no choice because we had no other options. All the TV networks had rejected us, everything. So we went into syndication. Even though the market was collapsing, we showed that it was a popular show enough that Cartoon Network picked it up. Once Cartoon Network picked it up, the rest is history. It exploded in the U.S. market with Cartoon Network and, and off to the ranges, uh, the, off, to the, off to the races. And then, honestly, from a challenge point of view, the other part of your challenge, the, the main challenge, and it still exists like 30 years later, the main challenge we still run into that I ran into from the very beginning is the Japanese salary man style structure and culture in Japan um, really prevented a lot of innovation and um, fast-paced, nimble um, business because in the entertainment industry, you've got to be moving like lightning, right? And so all the products that had to go through Japan for approval, all the marketing programs had to go through Japan for approval, and, 
And so things would get stuck all the time, like either never get approved or like I have a deal on the table that I just helped. All I did was do the intro, so I'm not financially part of it, but I introduced them. Like, it's been five months, they haven't even, even you know, proved the concept yet to, to allow them to make this ice shaker drink cup, you know? <laughs> They're like, <laughs> it's just a drink cup with Dragon Ball pictures when it come on. You know, like, it's five months, they haven't even approved it you know, or anything, and that's the kind of thing we run into. And that, it, it's, they just are very not rock the boat kind of attitude in, that, in the management of these companies. They just, uh, so they leave millions and millions and millions of dollars on the table because of that, that, that same culture still there. Um, and another classic example that just happened recently is NFTs. So NFTs hit the market. We said immediately thought, well, we should be in NFTs. Anime is perfect for it. Non-fungible tokens. Well, Japanese wouldn't approve it. It's always, well, which other major studios approved us? Well, nobody has. Well, then we're not going to be first. And, da -da 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 -da. and so, and we're like, yeah, but there's no risk because, you know, with NFTs, we're, we're just going to license it to a third party, and they're going to give us a check up front for the rights. So we're going to get millions of dollars in checks, and if they fail, they're the ones that eat the money, not us. We just got mailbox money, so we're just going to keep millions of dollars. They have to do the marketing, they have to make the sh NFTs, everything's on their burden. And yet the Japanese just wouldn't approve it. And the whole NFT cycle to its probably death right now passed anime by completely without making a penny out of NFTs. So that's the kind of thing we're, I'm talking about. So, so, so I want to just uh, follow up on one thing that you said about the Cartoon Network being um, you know, your, your, one of your big breaks, mm -hmm. at least initially. Um, how did you make that happen? Yeah, so um, honestly, it was Cartoon Network was a, a small network back then, and they weren't really that powerful back then. So you got to understand where they were. Cable was new ish at that time, you know, cable channels were starting to come on board. Um, so honestly, I think they saw um, some of the foothold we got from the syndication situation. And they contacted us because there's one guy who was a big Dragon Ball Z fan inside the programming group of, of uh, Cartoon Network. And he pitched it hard inside his co company to go pick up Dragon Ball. So they contacted us and we said, well, you know, yeah, we think cable's growing and you guys are still a pretty small you know, coverage of the US market, like half of the US households back at that time. But you know, let's, let's do this together. And we did. And, uh, we grew, they grew, and we grew because of us, if we grew because of them, you know, so mm -hmm. we both grew together in a sense, and, uh, and it was a great relationship. Those guys are wonderful, I had 25 great years with them, it, they're a great, fantastic group. So, so I want to talk a little bit about something I mentioned in my introduction, which was um, uh, your, your, your ownership of the company, you know, Funimation was sold in 2005 to Naver. Uh, and then uh, six years later, you purchased it back mm -hmm. um, and then sold it again uh, in 2017 to Sony Pictures. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little about like, you know, the, the, the history behind that, uh, why you sold it, bought it back, mm -hmm. um, how sure. that all worked out? Well, yeah, so um, took that initial couple million seed capital. Um, we actually never had another equity round and we never took a penny of debt in the company. So. So we were a one-round company. Um, and then by 2005, we had decided that we were, we, we were literally making like 80% of our revenues through home video, right? Uh, out of Dragon Ball, excuse me, uh, out of Dragon Ball, and a lot of it was through home video. And so what we saw was, even though there's hundreds and hundreds of episodes of Dragon Ball, we saw eventually how many releases of home video we had left in the next couple of years. So we thought, well, we have a couple year runway of Dragon Ball releases, and yeah, we're buying all these new titles like Yu Yu Hakusho and Fruits Basket and all these great shows, but we just were worried about the Dragon Ball tale. And so, um, no pun intended. And so, um, <laughs> and so we decided we'd better sell the company at, at the top of our game. And so uh, we put it on the market and we sold it uh, to the public. We had a couple, several bidders, but we sold it, uh, yeah, so we got a 62 times return on the invested capital in that company, so 62 Xer, and sold it. 
And then I stayed on as CEO. It was, a, it was part of a key man, key man deal where they wouldn't buy us without me signing up as a key man. So did that. But then the corporate entity that bought us started running into other financial issues because they were a company that all they did was pick, pack, ship, and warehouse products. So they took somebody else's product, pick, pack, shipped it, and shipped it to Walmart, Costco, Sam's Club. And so it was a super low margin business, right? A middleman business. And so they decided, well, we need to make more margin. We're going to go into the content, vertically integrate up into the content, right? And so, so they bought three entertainment companies in a row. We were the third. They successfully bankrupted the first two. <laughs> and so we were the last one left. Um, and then some activist shareholders jumped into the company and said, what are you doing with an anime company? Go back to your logistic roots, your logistics company. Go back to that. Focus only on that. And so they decided they would sell us. Um, the reason it took so long for me to get that, convince them they need to sell us, because I was trying to convince them from the inside. Like, you know, either I'm out of here soon, or you're going to have to sell it, and that kind of thing, um, was that even though they were a much bigger company, we were 65% of their EBITDA at that mm -hmm. time. And so they had an optical problem of getting rid of us. And so but the activist shareholders forced it, and they were choking me off because they were taking all our cash flow, so I knew I needed to get out of there. They put it on the market. At that time, the DVD market had started to collapse in the US. And we still made a lot of our money off of home videos, and so off of DVDs. And so what happened was that a lot of acquirers liked us, but wouldn't pay a high enough, a very high price for us. And so I saw a great opportunity to do a management-led buyout, gathered a couple friends. We went in and bought it out as management. So we did management-led buyout with a couple friends. I bought it for one-fifth the price I sold it to that company for, so one-fifth. And then we grew the company, and I sold it for 11 times higher than the equity we put into the buyout to Sony Pictures in 2017. So actually, it was a two-tranche deal, 11x on the first tranche. And then they made me keep five more percent, and it was 20-something x on the second tranche So uh, for the last 5% of the company. So, yeah. So, so I wanted to. Um, so, so this is this is this is really fascinating, and I wanted to see, um, hear a little bit more about some of your other successful partnerships, um, such as uh, Universal Pictures, mm -hmm. Hulu, Crunchyroll. Um, like, how have you, how have you made these connections and made these mutually beneficial contracts? Well, uh, of course, we were known as one of the top. Well, there's really only two competitors at that time, right? Uh, Crunchyroll and Funimation. Um, I mean, the other studios were dabbling, but they had gone into the market and then had pulled back out of the market, like Warner Brothers, Sony, um, Disney. Um, so what happened was is that um, um, the, the first sale, you said, right? No, the first, uh, I mean, um, partnerships Universal. Universal. Yeah, the, that, that was a home video deal. So what was happening is the home video deal was crashing, like I mentioned. Uh, we, needed, we felt scale was very important in home video. Universal had one of the best home video platforms in America. So them, Disney, Warner Brothers really had the best, were the three best at that time. Um, and so we did the deal because, um, you know, A, we wrote off of their contracts to get better COGS, cost of goods sold. So we got we were able to drop our cost of packaging and, and pr punching out DVDs and Blu-rays, right? So we rode their volume contract on that. That helped margin. But the real thing that helped us that we saw was that their scale forced a certain pricing within the retail market. And that was critical, because when we sold the Walmart, they would nitpick us and talk about it, you know, and change the pricing on us and discounted us because we weren't a big enough studio and all this stuff. But universal scale, they said, hey, if it's a new, say, movie, let's take an example, new movie release, all new re movie release, here's the wholesale price, no matter what it is. So we got the same wholesale as when they were releasing Jurassic Park, the movie. <laughs> we would get it the same for our anime. And so that literally popped our margins, our wholesale price, by 25% <laughs> wholesale price. 
And that was a phenomenal deal for us. Put way extra margin in our, on our bottom line, because both on the cost and the price side. And that was a great deal, still a lovely deal. Wonderful part, partners. They actually were uh, one of the people interested in buying Funimation when we went to the block, when Sony bought us. Um, Hulu was a situation of, of capital. So what was happening in the time at that time um, was that um, a couple 800-pound gorillas suddenly aggressively entered the, the anime market. They were called Netflix and Amazon Prime. They both jumped into the market hard. And Netflix started bidding two times the amount we were bidding for every show on all the A titles. They didn't want any of the lower titles, the B titles. You know, We were a volume shop as well as a hit shop. But on the hits, they wanted to beat us no matter what. So they were just doubling the price <laughs> against us. And Amazon was even bidding 50% higher on the price, too. And so we were getting a little concerned, honestly. Um, and then on top of everything, to compound insult to injury to us, um, Crunchyroll got bought by AT&T Warner Brothers. And they started backing them with more cash to compete against Funimation. So we thought we were in a big squeeze problem. One of the reasons we sold the company, actually, the second time. Um, and so we saw a great partnership opportunity at Hulu where we wouldn't cannibalize our streaming platform with their streaming platform the way we structured the deal. But they were going to give us a lot of capital to co-buy each title, a hit. They only wanted the A's as well. They didn't care about the B's. So we co-bought all the A's. They paid for at least half of the price each time. But they got a later window than we did on streaming. They got a limited number of shows so that they couldn't do the volume game against us. And so it was a great partnership that we had with Hulu. Um, then we did the deal with Crunchyroll because still we were killing each other on bidding for all the other shows that were on the market outside the A's. And so um, we, real, well, we realized all we were doing is beating each other up and making the Japanese really rich. And so, um, <laughs> and so we. Uh, uh, they approached us and they said, we need to do a joint venture and let's co-buy titles. And so, and here's how we're going to split the market. You, they're known for subtitles, we're known for dubs. Let's split subtitle dubs, dubbed in English uh, type, of, type of strategy. And, and that was the approach we took. But a really big motivator for them was that Warner Brothers 18T had decided they were going to bet big on a new platform platform called VRV. Does anybody remember VRV at all? OK, a couple of you. <laughs> um, it was supposed to be a multi-channel internet play. Like, they were going to be the Comcast of internet. They were, on the internet, they were going to have multiple channels. That you, so you sign up for with one subscription fee, and you get all these channels. You got Crunchyroll, you got Funimation, you got this, you got that. You got Mostly centered around geek culture at the time. And so they're doing a multi-channel thing. And so they were really focused on that, which is one of their motivations they approached us, because they really wanted us to be a channel on there. And that was a big initiative from corporate for their side. So um, we thought it wasn't going to hurt us, because they were willing to pay us a lot of money, a promise a lot of money uh, for getting on the channel structure. But we didn't think they would be big competition in the future, because we saw several major flaws in their business plan that we thought they're not going to overcome. Now, if we were wrong and their business plan worked, we were screwed. So it was kind of a bet in that sense, too. Um, but sure enough, as you know, VRV's collapsed since then and is no longer. But So it didn't work, which we knew wasn't going to happen. But, but that's why we were also willing to do the deal with somebody that was a direct competitor. Great. So, so um... I'm going to open it up to floor questions in a moment, so make sure you have your questions ready. I just want to ask one other question, which is um, uh, just about anime more generally, right? So um, a lot of um, Americans um, will, will you know, know anime as kind of a, as, as uh, a, a, an important manifestation of Japanese culture, um, and it's kind of a window into um, uh, a different a different country that most Americans will probably never go visit. I I, I seem to notice uh, one big difference between U.S. and Japanese cartoons is that U.S. cartoons tends to be about innate talent. You know, you have some superpower, uh, and Japanese cartoons tend to be about working hard to achieve a goal. Um, and it's not about it's not about who you are. It's about um, 
you know, uh, what you do. Um, and, but be that as it may, I kind of want to get a sense of your, your sense of how does anime uh, help uh, generate kind of uh, understanding about Japan um, um, and how has it affected international perceptions of Japan? Mm. Yeah, so, well, Japan, you know, when we started Funimation, all of it, Japan didn't have much influence on the pop culture side of America. Obviously, they had influences on electronics and cars and things, but not pop culture. And so, um, anime really introduced uh, Japanese pop culture to America, I think. Uh, and, um, and now it's permeated enough that I, I doubt there's a person under 35 that doesn't know what anime is, at least if they don't watch it themselves, or if they don't watch a lot of it, they probably almost certainly have a friend or relative that watches it. And uh, they certainly know influencers that they may admire or watch it. Uh, because there's a lot of influencers, you know, NFL stars, directors and um, producers in Hollywood, star talent that are like anime. And so you're, you're seeing, um, Changes like in American animation now, the art style has changed using a lot of anime art style, if you've noticed, especially in action and adventure shows. Um, you're seeing in live action a lot of uh, the concepts that were used in anime have shown up in many places in American Hollywood. So, because a lot of people were influenced. I mean, even in the early days, people like Josh Whedon was influenced and he made a, a, a show called Serenity that was basically Cowboy Bebop, <laughs> um, you know. Um, so, you know, so, um, and so, and he talks about it, you know, so it's not, not a secret. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, that's really, you know, pretty cool how that, that is permeating culture. And, um, and I think the U.S. perception of, of the Japanese culture is maybe they're not as stoic as we well, thought Japanese are, you know? <laughs> After you watch enough anime, <laughs> you're like, huh, these are a weird group of people. I mean, they're not that bad. So, no, I'm just kidding. But they're, they're not, you know, uh, all stoic. Um, but anyway, that, I think, you know, that, that, that's the kind of influence. But if anybody watched the US Open recently here, right in your backyard, no? Not a lot of sports fans, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, a woman on the women's side, a US, uh, an American won the US Open women's. Um, but when they, when they were interviewing her on, se or on center court right after the semifinal win, Pam Shriver was asking her, hey, what are you going to do now that you've won the semi going to the finals? What are you going to do in the next few hours? And Coco Goff said, um, watch some anime. <laughs> and, and then there's applause in the audience. She, she goes, no, literally, I, she said, literally today I watched four or five episodes of My Hero Academia before I played today. So, you know, it's influencing things, right? <laughs> That's great. Um, so I have lots more questions, but I want to give the audience a chance to ask questions. So if you've got uh, questions, um, I sort of see over here in the, in the front. I, uh, oh, just wait for the mic. And if you could just... Um, uh, oh, over here, this this woman over here. Um, if you could just um, just state your name and your your affiliation, that would be great. Hello. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much for coming here and talking to us. I'm currently a fourth year undergraduate student at Columbia, and I've heard a lot that the problem with following your passions and turning that into your business is at one point losing your passion for this thing and seeing it only as a job. So I was wondering, did you lose your passion for anime or do you still continue enjoying uh, this side of your business? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I enjoy both the business side and the anime, of course. And actually, the entertainment industry in general is, is, a, is a really exciting field. And so, no, there's no passion lost in that, in that at all. Um, now that's what I'm good at, so you know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to try to stick to my knitting as much as possible, I guess. Um, I see there are a lot of questions. Um, okay, this gentleman over here. Hi. Uh, hi uh, thank you so much for coming here again. Oh, state your name and affiliation. 
Yes, my name is Henry. Uh, I'm a film student, so I'm not really affiliated with business. But I just wanted to ask, uh, why did you leave or what contributed to you retiring uh, at Funimation? Well, so after I sold the company in 2017, um, the Sony executive structure doesn't give any equity. It's a salary position with bonuses, of course, but it's a salary position. And honestly, after cashing out twice in the company, um, I really didn't need to work for a living anymore. <laughs> so, um, so I didn't want a regular job, day to day grind, you know. So I told them, I promised them two years at most before I retire because I want to start doing my own things at that time. I want to be my own boss like I was for 25 years. <laughs> so, so I only promised them two years. I gave them those two years. So that's why. Uh, let's see. I see. Uh, up here in the white. Um. Hi, my name is Sachit. I'm a fourth year PhD student studying artificial intelligence. Um, so I wanted to ask, this is maybe quite detailed, but how much did, <clears throat> in the early days, <clears throat> sorry, the fan community, things like fan subs, there was a lot of like, bootleg VHS kind of things, even Crunchyroll started as a not completely legit site. How much did that kind of thing assess your, um, change your inf assessment of the demand for anime in the US and how much did it change how much you thought that it could work as a kind of legitimate business instead of just this kind of under the table, past the VHS tape around kind of thing? Right, well, yeah, I mean, look, piracy in the content industry is rampant no matter what, no matter what area you're talking about. Um, and yes, it was a big problem, especially with streaming, right? I mean, not really, um, not when it was in the VHS or DVD days, because uh, no legitimate retailer would buy a title if it's pirated. So you didn't see pirated stuff on Walmart, and you know, Amazon. <laughs> Best Buy, so, and you know, all, almost all our revenue came from the big retailers anyway. So, um, yeah, you can go to Chinatown and find it, but, but it was irrelevant. Streaming, though, that was a problem because there's a lot of illegal <laughs> streaming. And, um, and even today, by the way, within 24 hours of any release, it's on a pirate site right now, including our doves, you know, on a pirate site like that. So. It changes your business model, obviously, but a lot is still focused on, you know, support the industry, you know, don't break the law, you know, you know, buy from a legitimate source and all that. But yes, you, you still lose a lot to piracy. Um, now, one could argue in the early days of anime, it actually helped create the market, though, streaming did, because it finally gave national exposure to a lot of genres. Because remember, on the TV side, they were still pretty much only focused on action and adventures for male audiences. That was it. <laughs> yeah. um, that was our silo. And so you, know, you got exposed to all sorts of other genres, which work now in anime. So, so, so I actually want to just do a little follow-on question on this. Um, so um, you know, currently, AI is you know, it's the new buzzword. It's having a big impact in a number of different areas. Um, and I'm just wondering how anime, that whole industry, is navigating the, um, uh, the impact of AI, AI-created art, um, you know, uh, how it's affecting the quality of the productions, and what's it going to mean for the future of the industry? You know, where, where will we be in, say, five years? Hmm. Well, I think... AI is not going to do the heavy lifting in the creative for a long time. It's, it's, it's not going to write your whole script. It's not going to direct the show, especially. <laughs> um, so that, that heavy lifting on long form content is not, it's, it's a long ways away. So it's really going to be more used like a tool that assists you along the way. For example, it could start outlining a story that you, you ha idea you have, and it starts with the gives you the first draft outline or whatever. You still have to have a lot of good writers come in on after that. Um, maybe it'll start saving you costs and things like doing the backgrounds for animation or the in betweens, which are the 
between a keyframe of the animation, there's in between animation, it could maybe do something like that, which tend to get outsourced to China anyway right now. Um, you know, so there's, there's things it might do to help reduce costs. There's things it's gonna do to help generate ideas for the writers and the directors, you know, but uh, actually doing the heavy lifting is, is it's, it's a while, it's, it's a ways away, I think. Right. Now the quality that it generates, that's, the problem is that the image quality isn't good. They can make, anybody, a computer can make great images. It's, it's the other stuff, the creativity of directing it, the camera angles, the lighting, all these creative things. Is, yeah, it's not AI's thing. The other thing AI could be good at though in content is taking a lot of data and trying to figure out what the traits of a successful um, piece would look like. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, I think one of the best business plans right now out there that I'm willing to invest in, for example, is where the content isn't that high quality anyway, like YouTube, doing a lot of YouTube shorts, trying to bring all that big data in, trying to figure out what all the right traits are that make people think the, what, why certain videos get over a million views, and then copying those traits and, and having the AI try to do as much generation for as cheap as possible on short form content. So that's a business plan I could, I could invest in, for example, right. in AI. Okay, um, I see this man with the gray shirt. Thank you, um, hello, my name is Carson Eisner and I'm a junior at the Horace Mann School in the Bronx. And my question was, um, why do you think that um, American audiences in particular have adapted so fast and started watching anime in such like high qualities? Quantities. Yeah, so in the content industry, uh, at the end of the day, it's content is king, right? So content is king, which means great storytelling, engaging characters, and, and so what I think happened with anime is um, not only did it push the envelope and break the mold in many ways, like Dragon Ball Z, Z did for a kid's show, especially for a kid's show, it definitely broke the mold, right? I mean, back then, most of the animation was Roadrunner and Bugs Bunny and things like that. Um, your action shows might be something like He-Man at that time, right? And, and Dragon Ball is what, way more aggressive, way more sophisticated, you know? And so, and so things that break the mold do, uh, sometimes as long as the underlying content is good, can break out into hits like Dragon Ball, it helps them. Um, but the reason I think anime is, was gonna be around for a long time when we started, the, when we did the business plan and we stuck with anime. We decided we we're going to really stay on anime, not not make our own kids shows or, or adult shows or on our own or, or do anything like that. It's because, at the end of the day, um, the anime industry, in the anime industry overall in the world, there's nowhere more competitive than in Japan with animation in the anime industry. So, it's a similar concept to why does a little small country like Canada keep producing so many good professional hockey players, right? Well, it's because all the athletic talent in America goes to football and basketball, and then maybe baseball. It's, hockey's not kind of, you know, <laughs> while in Canada, the social cultural pressures, a lot of people go toward hockey, and so therefore they have the best talent, there's the culture for it, there's societal pressure. Well, that's the same in anime in Japan. A lot of the creative talent, they can get rich just drawing a manga in their garage, right? And they do get rich doing that. And if you only have to have one hit. And then the best of those get published by the big manga companies like Shueisha. And so there's this huge pyramid to get to the top. So you got all these people with lots of talent taking shots at the market, which then get picked up by the publishers and get wide exposure because in Japan, comics actually sell enough units to make a difference on a national level versus America. And then only the top of those get turned into anime. I mean, only a fraction of manga get turned into anime because it's very expensive to me. <laughs> and so now, you know, you're getting this content whittled down, whittled down to that. And so, so they generate both quality and volume of content because there's, so, there's plenty of cultural and societal and infrastructure there to pump out phenomenal content. And since content is king, they're constantly pushing the envelope in Japan for the next new cool I give. So why do you think we, some of our shows like Oron Host Host Club became a hit? You know, like, 
Who would sit there and say, let's make a show about a bunch of guys that want to create a host club to introduce people to their high school so they can meet girls. So it's a bunch of guys that decide to create a host club in their high That was a hit. Or Yuri on Ice, which is you know, a hit. You know, this is about two males that decide they're going to be a couple in, in, uh, in figure sk skating and compete as a couple, even though it's two guys, of course. There's the whole LGBTQ angle as well in there. And, and that was a hit. So you know, people are cost in anime, you have to because it's so damn competitive that you gotta make, you gotta do something, right? And that's why anime is gonna continue to be crushed the con in the crush in the content area. It's just that 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 infrastructure is gonna cause it. Um, I actually want to ask a question which which came from uh, actually one of uh, online from one of the, the, the registrants. Um, who asked, uh, looking back, what do you think made Dragon Ball Z so successful in the United States? Uh, how has Funimation's strategy in choosing anime evolved over the years? Mm. Um, and uh, how has the company's approach to localization changed mm. from when you first started the company in the, in the 90s? Yeah, that's a big question on the title selection. But um, <laughs> I spent a lot of time on title selection. All 25 years. Um, well, first of all, Dragon Ball Z was a success because of some of the things I said. At the end of the day, content is about great story development and, and storytelling and great characters and engaging characters. And clearly, Dragon Ball has that. So, so we knew we had the content that was there. And the, the foundation was absolutely there. And so the second thing I already mentioned was it pushed the envelope, right? Mm -hmm. So because it pushed the envelope, it had a lot of buzzworthiness because all the kids talked about it, like, did you see that on, on you know, kids, kids' time slot? Like, look, they're beating the living crap out of each other. Like, you know, <laughs> like kind of cool. Um, and so um, and lots of great martial arts, all that kind of thing. So um, then another thing that, that then, of course, eventually made, made it, well, of course, but then we got TV distribution on Cartoon Network. That was obviously critical in making a success. Um, and then the final thing that's made it such a, uh, both the classic and the nostalgia, and it's still a great current title. Is just it has a lot of episodes, you know, and so <laughs> having a lot of episodes is is going to make a, you know can make a big show if the content underlying content is very good. Um, in terms of title selection, so that's evolved over the years quite a bit. So at first it was just male action adventure, usually with a sci-fi or fantasy twist that was important. And sci-fi and, and fantasy is still a very important part of most anime. Um, but as the fan base grew, the demographics changed. Females came into the market. The demos got younger and younger. So we pretty much made 95% of our revenue from 18 to 34-year-olds. Now there's enough of a segment that's over like 15 to 18-year-olds that are actually in, into anime. Um, so and then if you go to all anime cons that are all over the US, You'll probably see 45% of the uh, audience be female now that come to the conventions. So, um, so demographics changed, which then obviously made our title selection change because now we could go broader. We could buy shows like Fruits Basket and Oran Host Club <laughs> and those kind of things. Um, but um, um, the problem we ran into, though, is that remember our original business plan was hey, let's only get the hits, but we waited for, till it was a hit, then we bought it. Well, then a couple of our smaller competitors start trying to jump us in the market, try to buy before it even, it was being produced, right? And so then we had to start making some decisions early to avoid that, and then streaming happened. And then it was over without waiting for anything. We were buying shows before the first episode even came out. We'd have a, a deck this thin that says, here's some pictures, an idea of what this show is. You're going to buy it for a million bucks? That was, that's, the de that's the deal that <laughs> went down that. And so you're buying shows off of nothing because you got to simulcast it within a day after it hits Japan because within two days, it's on a pirate site. So you had to be out there. And so um, we're buying shows, like I said, on a few pieces of paper. So then the title selection became all about um, First and foremost, is based on a manga. Because when you look at all the original programming that the studios have pumped out of Japan, original content, a large percentage failed compared to a manga-based title. So a manga-based title is four times more likely to succeed for various obvious reasons. Um, 
The other thing is you still have genres that don't work, and they, a lot of them still don't work, like sports anime or period, historic period pieces. Now, yes, there have been breakouts in sports anime, like finally there was one on volley, girls volleyball, I think it was called Hi-Q, Hi, Hi, Hi that bro broke out. Um, you know, but they're, they're rare, and um, like I said, historic period pieces, even samurai period pieces, you'd think people wouldn't be into samurai anime, but if it's purely historical without a sci-fi fantasy twist, it probably wasn't gonna work. Simpsons like comedy, you know, family like guy like comedy. Um, idol bands, huge money made in Asia off of girl idol bands and stuff, right? Can't make a penny in North America with those. I don't know why. So we don't know why, but honestly, but you know, so, so genre matters a lot in the title selection part. Um, and then, of course, the other part, two parts of title selection, uh, title selection was politics, meaning, oh, you want this hit? Well, let me introduce you to two of her cousins over here. <laughs> and so we'd have to buy all three titles, you know, to get the hit. The two cousins came with the package, you know. <laughs> um, uh, so that's title selection. Uh, another. Another problem with the Japanese market that's very different than Hollywood is that they're terrible at, at the way they do sequels. They, they don't do sequels, and there's a whole bunch of reasons on why you'd think they would just keep pumping out sequels, but they, they, their structure doesn't really allow it. But that's going to be another five-minute conversation, to be honest with you. So, so we're, all, we're, we're, we're just about out of time, but I want to I finish with one question, just kind of addressing the audience. Um, you know, whether there's anything that we haven't covered that you think is important, and also whether you have any advice for you know um, our business school mm. students and uh, or just students in general um, about what to um, you know uh, what they should bear, bear in mind what they should think about. Mm. Well, I don't think there's anything. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of topics in running a company and running an anime company, but I don't think there's anything particular I can think of but there. But uh, for your recent, I mean, I know a lot of this audience are graduating undergrad or graduate school of business, so I probably don't have a piece of advice that you guys probably haven't heard from a lot of smart people, honestly, but, um, but you know, I mentioned some, like, follow your passion, that's important, I think. One of the things my dad taught me when I was really young is uh, work where the smartest people are. You know, you're going to learn so much from the smart people around you. Um, um, another thing that a lot of executives told me, even when I was way back in college, and was uh, follow the money, meaning that like if you're going to go work for Funimation, try not to work in their home video division, which is <laughs> try to work in their streaming division, you know, which is growing 50% a year over here. You know, home video slowly dying. You know, so follow the money in the company. You know, within that company, um, I think people over over overemphasize compensation, which I don't think is the right thing to think about when you're that young, um, and. Um, I think people don't interview their managers that they're trying to, when they're coming into a company, they're just happy to get an interview. But really, if you have a great manager that you work for, so you interview your manager and see if they're good and what their track record is, it's amazing because that's the person that has more experience and will teach you a lot. And that's the person that's going to drag you up the chain when they get promoted quickly. You're going to get promoted quickly. And when they jump ship to a hotter company, they're going to take you with them. You know, so. Those kind of things all helped my career, honestly. And, um, and then from an entrepreneurial perspective, um, I think, um, let's put it this way. We do a lot of you know, venture capital investing. And one thing we do not do is invest in a 20-something-year-old or 32-year-old founder that has no other people surrounding him on his team. So, there's just no way, no matter how smart you are, I don't care if you're top of class Columbia, at 32, you have an ex any ex enough experience to know how to run a company. So if you're trying to be an entrepreneur and found a company at 32, you had better have a partner or co-CEO CEO or whatever that has a lot of years of experience in that exact silo of that industry. Um, otherwise, there's no chance you're going to get a sophisticated investor or a venture capitalist that's any good to invest in you, that's for sure. Um, you can get friends and family, maybe. And um, 
And one big thing I learned at Tandem that I, that I think I never got out of business school at, at Columbia that I, thought, I think they should have taught more of is, is um, sales and negotiation. I think it should almost be a mandatory class if you're going to an MBA program is, is negotiation and sales class. Um, you just use it for everything. It's just like, every, you know, you've got to learn that. You can't just learn every technical thing of how to read spread, uh, you know, counting statements and this or five forces theory here or whatever. You've got you to gotta know that side of the business. And the biggest one, the most important things about that side of the business is also the politics that are involved in that. So Jimmy Tribig, the founder of Tandem, taught me when I was in my 20s. He goes, you know, you know, we're selling $10 million, $20 million computer systems. And a sales guy would come to me and says, damn, I just lost that bid to Lockheed because of politics. And his answer to that salesman is, every big sale is politics. That means you didn't read, read, read the room right, you didn't do your due diligence, you didn't do your homework, every deal is politics. And so that's something he pounded into my head when I was young. And believe me, he's right. You know? um, so. Well, 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 well. Thanks so much. That that was that was great. And I just want to thank you for a tremendous discussion. I think uh, we had enormous turnout. Uh, it was a great, great event. Um, and I just would like to invite everybody to just thank our speaker again, Afikanaga. Uh, <laughs>